disclosures haven't changed. So I'm not actually here to sell the concept of endoscopy nor convince you that you need to adopt this into your practice immediately. But I do want to sort of provide you with some background, some of the current updates and applications outcomes. But I really want to address the elephant in the room with endoscopy. And that's sort of the cost and financial discussion and, and what the incremental benefit actually is when we perform so many simple decompressions really well. But we know endoscopy is growing. As you can just look at the publications over the past decade. They are flying. Lots of research discussing this. Um, I'm going to sort of fly through a lot of these slides as well, because I know we'll have some time in the lab where we can sort of just ask you know, questions one-on-one, -on -one and I can go through a lot of the details. At this point, there's a lot of applications to date. Uh, depending on how you consider the quality of research, a lot of it is early, uh, but there's certainly a lot of case reports and, and level four evidence out there demonstrating uh, some of the benefits and very uh, unique applications. As many of you know, it's often uh, a division set between uniportal and biportal you just have to remember, right? These are just different techniques, but the principles are very similar and the goals of surgery are essentially identical, right? Just be careful with the neurologic elements. Your goal is to decompress. If there's any stabilization required, make sure that it remains stable and don't create a deformity. I think that if you set the techniques aside, one of the biggest differences between a uniportal and biportal system and technology and technique is the cost factor, right? You could start biportal endoscopy tomorrow in your hospital using equipment there, where often with a uniportal system, there is a capital and, and the equipment. Uh, there's two common approaches, which we'll go through in the lab today. Uh, we'll stick with sort of the lumbar spine, because that is sort of what's most researched now, is your transforaminal uh, approach and your intralaminar, which I think everyone knows incredibly well, because that's our um, most common uh, access for decompression. Here you can see a pictorial evidence. Arthrex will be during our lab today, but they also have uh, some great pictures that sort of demonstrate that. So if we look at the interlaminar approach uh, initially. I think one of the best places to start is the L5-S1, just like with any discectomy we do in practice early on, especially from a uh, minimally invasive standpoint however you don't want to define those terms. Uh, just know your landmarks. It's an easier access. You've got a larger inner laminar window. There's generally less bony work at this level, especially if you're um, trying to do a discectomy. Uh, make sure you're able to visualize a pulsatile nerve root upon decompression. And the initial indications, you know, discectomy and decompression are a great way to go. So there you can sort of see the pulsatile nerve root. The procedural steps that we'll go through today are just sort of uh, targeting with a bullseye, feeling the click going through the fascia, as this will be a sort of a uniportal lab, uh, cleaning the trampoline is how, how they call it, sort of identifying the ligament and flavum, and then creating this black hole through uh, the ligament itself. You want to make sure you identify the edges uh, of the nerve root uh, so you're not causing a large CSF leak and then delivering the herniation if there's a discectomy. This is a great starting case to do with a large 5-1 disc herniation um, with the x-rays there. And then this is what I, we talked about with the bullseye and the inner laminar window. Here we talk about sort of cleaning the trampoline uh, when you're identifying the ligament. And again, uh, I won't sort of belabor these points or show you the entire videos just because you will see this uh, when you're doing it yourselves uh, in a few minutes after lunch here then sort of creating that black hole going through the ligament uh, very carefully, and then identifying the edge of your nerve root uh, there, and then obviously uh, retracting and uh, carefully retracting and protecting the nerve root as you uh, retrieve the disc. And these are the videos that everyone always likes to show from an endoscopic standpoint uh, because it is quite satisfying. So as much as I don't want to fast forward this one, well, at least you'll get to do this yourself very shortly. So that's the interlaminar approach. I, I think we know that approach very well. And even if you have not done any endoscopic techniques before in training, which I think many of you have not, it'll feel more familiar even in a uniportal standpoint. So then there's the transforaminal approach. And I think from an endoscopic standpoint, this is where the uh, benefit becomes uh, greater and where you can start seeing greater incremental sort of uh, Im improvement in the way you can access some of this pathology, right? This is sort of the original endoscopic spine approach. Um, and it's technically easier uh, than inner laminar approach, but I will say that the anatomy is a little bit less familiar than the inner laminar approach. It's ideal for foraminal and extra foraminal lumbar herniations. And then uh, obviously with advanced techniques, you're able to address pathology in, in different ways. There's the anatomy there. Kamen's triangle we often know very well from your uh, T-lift approach. Uh, very important in this setting. 
uh, the steps we'll probably discuss today, we call it DISC. You want to draw your lines because of the trajectory you'll be taking to uh, Kamen's triangle. You want to be able to infiltrate, which will be placing a needle, then dilating, then docking, and then sort of finding your home, making sure you know where the boundaries of the with Camden's are, understanding where your SAP is, and then C is curing the patient. Um, so in terms of drawing the lines, right, you get your AP X-ray, you're marking your midline, then you, uh, you sort of mark out a perpendicular line across the disc space, uh, the center of the disc space which you're approaching. And then you can put this instrument um, on the lateral aspect of the patient's body and you're sort of measuring the distance from the front of the disc to the dorsal aspect of your skin. And then when you draw that out from midline on the back, this will be the distance between your midline line and then where you'll be entering from a sort of paracentral or a paralateral standpoint. And the reason is because we have these, you're utilizing this sort of transverse plane between your sagittal and coronal plane. And so the trajectory that you're often taking is somewhere between sort of 25 and 40 degrees. And again, so we'll be taking an AP and lateral X-ray and we'll sort of mark out where we'll be entering um, with our needle before we're docking and dilating. This will make a lot more sense uh, when we're using C-arm fluoro. Uh, step two, uh, you wanna be able to understand where you are from an anatomic standpoint. And here you can see some uh, illustrations of the SAP, your exiting nerve root, uh, your disc, uh, and your traversing nerve root as well. And then you know we'll be infiltrating uh, here. You can see that mark that we, that's been made in the long needle that'll be utilized to eventually pop through. And what you'll see on X-ray is this lateral view where you're, you're entering towards the disc space. Obviously, you want to be below the foramen here so you're not injuring the exiting nerve root. And then on an AP X-ray, you are seeing uh, your trajectory into that lateral aspect of the disc. Again, uh, here's finding your home again before you're doing a lot more work. Once you dilate and dock, if you need to do any bony resection, uh, this is what it will often look like. The transition has made a lot more sense when I was putting this together, but not so much now. And then here we will have different instruments that allow you to sort of reach into the foramen to begin your decompression or to perform the discectomy itself. And then curing the patient, removing the disc herniation. Now, I just want to spend a couple minutes on addressing uh, the elephant in the room when we talk about endoscopy. I think uh, everyone feels as though the procedure they can do the most reproducibly and reliably is probably a discectomy or a decompression. And if you're doing it through a 16 or 18 millimeter tube, but what's the actual incremental benefit uh, of endoscopy? And then why are we making a decompression or discectomy, which doesn't reimburse all that high in our system? How can we even justify purchasing equipment for such a cheap procedure that's so reliable where you're not going to alter length of stay much, right? Because for years, we, we've debated various topics, you know, and we've debated them today, right? How do you prevent PJK? How do you best address a fusion? What do you do with the spondy? And on and on and on. But the difficulty is this, right? We have this growing success of well-indicated spine surgery, but as spine technology and the hardware industry continues to provide us with all these innovations, uh, we have to sort of think about other things, right? The spine world is financially struggling. I think we're seeing that tremendously now. We've got this lag of the pandemic that people still use as an excuse, and you know our CMS reimbursements are declining. So in addition to all this sort of uh, philosophical, anatomic, and biomechanic considerations we have to place for our patients, we actually have to factor cost in our discussions and decisions. So I always like to decide because, you know, Coco Chanel says it best, right? Sometimes our world feels like this, where the best things in life are, are, are free, and the second best things are very, very expensive, right? So if we are to try to start justifying uh, these expenses for what we call the best things, like how do we actually define and demonstrate value in our patient care, right? And so we look at value, it, the, the equation's really simple, right? It's quality over cost. But the difficulty is that determining the actual variables can be a bit more complex, right? How do you best define the quality of your outcomes? Is it PROs? Is it satisfaction? Is it something more objective? And the cost to whom, right? The whole hospital system, insurance companies, the patients, 
time savings loss, the opportunity cost, right? And then the problem is the cost issue is magnified by the law of diminishing returns, right? If we're talking about an MIS decompression compared to that of an endoscopic decompression discectomy, right? The margins of our improvements are also shrinking with each technology. From a micro standpoint, we just want to do uh, what's best for our patients. But from a macro standpoint, it's really becoming more difficult to justify an, exp an additional expense for little potential gain. And so, right, we're back to this endoscopic spine surgery situation, and we know the outcomes are promising, right? Maybe even less invasive than our traditional MIS approaches, lower requirements for inpatient care, uh, potentially expedited recoveries that we're seeing. Uh, but are the ergonomics uh, actually improved? Are we actually seeing reduced costs? And why have we not seen tremendous growth in the U.S. until, you know, recently? Obviously, there's a learning curve. There's a lack of available sites for training, which are slowly changing. But there's a whole reimbursement side of this that is uh, impacting how we're thinking about surgery. And if you look at a lot of the cost analysis papers that are out there between endoscopy uh, and open laminectomies and, and tubular laminectomies and decompressions, they're actually all over the place. Some studies show that it's more expensive with endoscopy. Some studies show that the you know, cost per you know, quality adjusted life here is a little bit less for endoscopic versus a tubular microdiscectomy. Um, the, some studies show that the surgical costs actually are higher, but if you stretch it over time, the cost to the healthcare system is lower, which also means that we just don't actually know and that there's so many methodological limitations in heterogeneous populations in these studies. So I think how do you make the case at the end of the day? Um, you, you just, what we're seeing now are patients are demanding it. Right. Patients are coming in wanting endoscopic surgery. They don't really know what that means, but there's certainly a demand. And then I think that we have to do a better job with high quality multicenter research, right? Where we're expanding our knowledge base and long term outcomes, especially as we're using these techniques in the cervical and thoracic spine. And, and, and this is where industry will help us to sort of improve our instrumentation and visualization, but we have to do it in sort of a financially uh, sustainable way where we're being good stewards of our resources. So thank you. So I want to learn from you later, and I'm a avowed macroscopist <laughs> and not uh, endoscopist. But um, the, the key question I have for you is uh, there's this word called learning curve, which for me is a euphemism of complications. And uh, what's the learning curve, and how can you minimize the, quote, learning curve? Uh, the learning curve is massive. <laughs> it is a, a, a learning curve, if you look at literature, it's anywhere between 35 to 75 cases. And there is inherent risk of anything that we do in surgery where we're innovating and we're progressing. But I think that we have to find ways to responsibly progress through our learning curve so we're not injuring patients along the way. You know, we talked about earlier how you don't want your residents putting in pedicle screws for the first time in a live patient. I think there needs to be more opportunities to train, and then there just needs to be an algorithm in the cases that you're taking on you know, early, right? You don't want to jump to the hardest cases because they're there right away, but there really should be stepping stones of cases where, you know, maybe it is a, a large 5-1 disc herniation that that is what you're doing first because that's where there's the least risk, but there's a learning curve and it is high. And then I just want to say something about current statistics. So it's the age-old discussion of efficacy versus efficiency. So there are clear pioneers, early adopters like yourself, Roger Hartle, uh, Chris Hofstetter here in town, who define the literature. They've uh, obviously gone through a learning curve, and they do a very nice job, really nice job. And we actually send patients back and forth all the time. Now, here's my point. So when we get statistics from these people who have gone past the learning curve, we'll get very favorable statistics, reasonably speaking. The efficiency is, so this is a targeted population of high performers. If this goes out into the general population, we'll have the efficiency paradigm, meaning it just all flattens out and it becomes a far bigger problem. So I um, ask all of us to apply a fair bit of care when we look at these statistics because, again, if it's efficacy versus efficiency, um, this is not what we have an evaluation for right now. We're still in the efficacy phase of trying to prove a technology. Absolutely. This, this is not an efficient procedure in its current state compared to the other tools that we have. Well, we're at the end of our lecture phase. Dr. Skouyan, do you want to tell us what we're doing next?